Let me welcome you to the uh, sixth session of the Urban Governance and Civic Participation Lecture Series uh, hosted by the Democracy Institute of Central European University and the Department of Medieval Studies here. Uh, it's my great pleasure to, to welcome as a speaker for this evening, Andreas Lehnert, uh, one of the rising stars in medieval Jewish studies. Uh, he had the good fortune of being born in Trier because as many of you know, Trier is one of the great centers, not only of medieval Jewish life, but also uh, modern uh, Jewish studies. And it is exactly at the University of Trier where he obtained his uh, master's degree in history and German studies. And then uh, his uh, doctoral dissertation uh, completed under the supervision of uh, Professor Lucas Clemens and Professor Rafit Haferkamp. And uh, this work, as many of you probably know it, was published as Judensiegel in Spätmittelalterlichen Reisgebiet, Begläubigungsprozess und Selbstpräsentation von Judinnen und Juden in two thick and very important volumes uh, last year, the Jewish seals in the medieval German kingdom, authentication and self-representation of Jewish women and men in English translation of the title, he obtained this uh, doctoral degree with the help of uh, several fellowships. And afterwards, he joined first a postdoc fellowship in the Forschungszentrum Europa at the University of Trier. And then he was uh, included in an important uh, research project in Jerusalem entitled Beyond the Elite, Jewish Daily Life in Medieval Europe at the Hebrew University. Uh, led by Professor Elisheva Baumgarten. And uh, he is still affiliated member of this project, but uh, last year he received an even most, more prestigious postdoc fellowship of the Martin Buber Society of Fellows at the Hebrew University. And currently he's working on his habilitation project on, on the topic of uh, Jewish craftspeople in medieval Europe. And his research uh, focuses on several different aspects of social, cultural, and religious history of uh, Jews in Europe, not only sealing processes, but also various documents. He have edited uh, important early documents in the Yiddish language. He pays attention to also the backsides of the documents, the charter notes, and uh, in general, he works on Jewish life and uh, society and their integration into medieval Europe. So we are looking very much forward to, uh, to his talk this evening. But before that, let me also mention that he runs a very important blog on the Hypothesis Org, Medieval Jewish Studies Now. And I am posting uh, in the chat uh, a link to that for those very few in the audience who uh, has not uh, been acquainted with this blog uh, so far. And uh, now we are very much looking forward to uh, Andreas's talk uh, to us about um, Jewish uh, participation in urban societies in uh, the Holy Roman Empire. So Andreas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Katalin, for this uh, kind, sweet introduction. I'm very happy to be invited uh, to present a paper in this series of excellent lectures. Uh, and I wish to express my gratitude to the organizers, Katalin Sende, Sende, Susanne Rau, and Zoe Opacic for having me. I'm also very happy to see so many uh, friends here. I saw Teddy, Maria, Birgit, Eveline, Christoph, and Avia already. Thank you for uh, tuning in. So let me share my screen. You see this? Yes. Okay, I put my reading advice here. So my lecture today will focus on civic participation among Jewish people in the medieval Holy Roman Empire. When we think about the history of the Jewish people in the European Middle Ages, many tend to think about pogroms, expulsions, religious dissertations, the burning of books, many money lending, hardships like high taxation and much more. On the one hand, we have enough evidence to suggest this was all true and part of the complex Christian-Jewish relations over the centuries. On the other hand, we also know 
that is the that it is the extreme times that often impacted people the most. So it is more likely for such acts to be written down, commemorated, and told from generation to generation. We hear a lot less about how the Jewish tailor gossiped with the Christian baker at the corner of a house. In the same way, the random discussions between neighbors, like a Jewish woman and a Christian woman, when they met in, at an urban well to draw water, have never survived to tell the tale. Such interactions didn't cost any money. They didn't include violence or legal disputes, and it is precisely for that reason that they were never recorded. Still, it is this kind of mundane life that scholars are trying to understand more in recent years for what it says about medieval relations. So if our sources mainly confront us with the with Jewish people's money lending and business engaging in legal disputes and being subject to violence, then how can we learn a bit more about the question that brings us together virtually today? Namely, how did Jewish men and women participate in different institutions of the medieval urban centers? How did they participate as citizens where they lived? What forms of civic part participation did they enjoy? I have entitled my talk today, Seals and Oath-Taking, Jewish Civic Participation in the Medieval Holy Roman Empire, because I wish to show with the help of these two common urban practices of medieval life, sealing documents and taking oath, how Jewish men and women enjoyed forms of civic participation, how they were well aware and actively part of the different law systems and urban customs where they lived. There is no doubt that the economic field has shaped the perception of medieval Jewish Christian interactions because it produced most of the sources we can study. Business interactions made Jews and Christians negotiate legal terms, customs, and also gave them ways to apply them. Reaching agreements publicly with a seal and or an oath was therefore part of a legal system that really brought Jews and Christians together on a daily basis. Now, to better understand aspects of Jewish civic participation in German lands via sealing practices and oath taking, my talk will be structured as follows. I will give some background, especially on the discussion of Jewish citizenship. Then I will continue with Jewish oath taking in connection with citizenship, followed by Jewish sealing in connection with citizenship, and finally, examples of oath taking and sealing together in civic matters of urban life before I come to a conclusion. As our first order of business, let's address the question of Jews as citizens in the medieval Holy, Rem Holy Roman Empire societies. The Jews have full citizenship, were they full members of the urban society, also in legal terms, and could they enjoy civic participation? My teacher, Alfred Haferkamp, for example, has studied Jewish citizenship and showed how complex this topic presents itself in our sources. Indeed, Jews often could acquire different forms of citizenship in a number of medieval cities, like many other people living in urban settings. We find one nice example for the concept of what is referred to as fellow citizenship, concefilitas. In the record you see here from the city of Koblenz in the Rhineland, dated to the year 1307, the knights, judges, and the whole civic commune of Koblenz, Milites, Scabini Totaque, Universitas Opidi Confluentini, addressed the councilman and the other members of the Jewish community, magistratus and universitas, at Universitas Studiorum, declaring that the Jews had become citizens of the town. This is to say that the Jews were given fellow citizenship or concivilitas. The text goes on to explain that the Jewish community paid 20 marks every year for this concivilitas. This record was preserved in the Jewish communal archive, which we know because of the Hebrew note written on the back of the record. This Hebrew dorsal note reads, from the citizens of Cologne saying that the Jews too are citizens in the town. Min ha'ironim she'ayuidim hem ironim ba'ir. I cannot answer the question if we are to understand fellow citizenship, concivilitas, the same way as full citizenship, but we also cannot apply modern terms to medieval understandings and the concept of citizenship clearly differed from city to city. However, the Hebrew dorsal note does not make a difference here since the word for Christian citizen is the same as for the Jewish citizens, namely ironim, citizens. 
But the citizenship was not possible everywhere. In the, in the Austrian duchy, for example, there was no citizenship granted to the Jewish population. Still, civic participation in a broader sense was possible for them. It's clear that not everyone could nor wanted to acquire forms of citizenship. The fact that citizenship and also some forms of civic participation was not always of interest to Jews living in the towns results, for example, from the manifold obligations that came with such commitments. Noble people, much of the clergy and other members of ecclesiastical communities, students at universities and Jews, they all often built different parallel communities within urban settings, and they also often had no citizenship. But did all these groups and communities not participate in the medieval towns and did they not enjoy different forms of civic interaction? Let us try to see if we can guess a sense of civic participation in sources that do not mention Jews as citizens, but might give us a sense of the importance Jews had for a city and how they might have participated in urban settings. A look into one of the earliest sources for the constitution of a Jewish community within the German speaking lands is highly instructive in this case. For a long time during the higher middle ages, Jewish communities undeniably had outspoken positive functions within the urban centers. One of the earliest privileges of settlement for Jews in the Holy Roman Empire is the famous charter issued by the Bishop of Speyer, Rüdiger Husmann, in the year 1084. In his charter, the bishop declared that he wished to give the village of Speyer in the Rhein Rhineland a boost by transforming it into a city and by doing so, he wished to amplify the importance of Speyer a thousand times by also settling Jews in it. Cum experensi villa urban tacerem, putari milies amplificare honorem loci nostril, si et judeus colligerem. Now let's hold here and think about this bishop who tells everyone in this written record from 1084 that he wants the village of Speyer to become a fully fledged town. And for him, this meant to settle Jews in there as well. Rüdiger even says here that the honor and importance of Speyer would be increased by a thousand times by settling Jews in the city. Rüdiger also emphasized in his charter, in his Charta, that, the, that he granted the Jews the best or the, the best law, the best legal system as the Jewish people have no better one in no other city in the whole Roman empire. Concessi illis legem quam cumque meliorum habit populus juriorum in qua libet urbe teutonici regni. Alfred Haferkamp suggested that this idea of creating towns in the image of Rome, imitatio Rome, and by extension, in also, also in the image of Jerusalem, was a broader reform movement within the German towns under the rule of bishops in the 11th century. As for the given example, we even have a Hebrew report on this foundation act of the Jewish community in Speyer. Sometime after the bishop's charter, an anonymous Jewish author confirmed that, I quote, he, Bishop Rüdiger, Rüdiger Husmann, accepted us with a happy face and he also sent his lords and knights to follow us into the city. The act, the fact that this bishop sent his highest representatives to welcome and guide the Jews into his city is in many ways quite remarkable. We know such scenes, of course, from the arrival of kings and popes, for example. The act of settling Jews in Speyer, therefore, was an honorable act for both the bishop and the Jews. So we see here a very positive 11th century depiction of Jewish presence and their function in towns of the Holy Roman Empire. But there were clear limitations. For example, Jews could not be part of the Christian municipal governments or municipal councils. This went alongside ecclesiastical demands that no Jew should rule over Christians or as it was put in Canon 96 of the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, no Jew should hold public offices. But with regards to such offices, I wish to emphasize here that not only some other groups, but actually most other groups too, were not part of this ruling elite. 
And by far, not everyone was even interested in taking offices, since these oftentimes required larger sums of money and time to be invested. We know of many cases where even fees were set up in order to push those who would deny taking an office after having been elected. This is even true for such groups as craft guilds and the masters they elected as their guild members. While we see that one form of citizenship was acting in local urban governance, governance and municipal councils, we can imagine that the range of Jewish citizenship was certainly different than that of Christians. Then again, quite a good number of Jews did serve as official tax collectors or local rule, for local rulers, for example, in the field of customs and also as mint masters. In the first half of the 14th century, some Jews in the city of Trier seem to have had official positions at the financial court of Archbishop Baldwin since they conducted business in his name. This means we can see that uh, we can see Jews that had various other roles to play for the town and its local rulers. These examples may be extraordinary, but it is important to stress that Jews also took offices as leaders of their own communities. They were cantors in the synagogue, ritual slaughterers and meat inspectors. Most importantly, Jews served as mediators between Jewish and Christian communities as judges in the Jewish courts of law and as members of the Jewish council. This background on Jewish citizenship or Jews as civilians in medieval German lands is all to say that the role of the Jewish population had within the medieval centers of the Holy Roman Empire defines much of this possible civic participation they were able to enjoy. Jews were an integral part of the medieval towns, and this can be seen in many different areas. For example, the most, the almost always, they almost always lived in the very towns, centers, close to the main markets, the best business streets, and also in high proximity to cathedrals and municipal halls. In Cologne, the Christian councilman even crossed the Jewish quarter to reach the municipal hall. And since the Jews had the control, had the control of the keys to the gates of the Jewish quarter, the councilman asked the Jewish community in a record from the earlier 14th century to keep the gates open on those evenings the councilman would have to hold longer sessions. From the high middle ages into the late middle ages, however, this role and position of the Jews received more and more cracks. After the persecutions at the time of the Black Death, much had changed already and it became even worse by the end of the 14th century when expulsions began in a larger scale from towns and dominions. Jews also sometimes were accepted in the towns because of the financial needs these towns faced. In Diesenhofen in Switzerland, for example, a certain Jew was accepted in the year 1426 as a citizen and the municipal council explained that this happened because I quote, we have unfortunately huge debts and therefore really need Jews and other people in our town in order to bear better the huge taxes we have to pay annually. When wir leider in großen Schulden stand und wohl bedürften, dass wir Juden und andere Leute inne nehmen, um dass wir die großen Stör so wie ehrlichen geben müssen, Destabas ertragen möchten. Taxation too is another point that can easily exemplify the importance Jews had for the towns who notoriously ran short in financing their projects or wars, very much like emperors, kings, kings, noblemen and bishops, etc. Okay, so from this introduction, we've seen some possibilities and limitations of Jewish citizenship in medieval German lands. Let's move now on to the main part of this talk, which considers how Jews could express their civic participation within these limits. First, let us turn to the question of oath taking. Here you see a beautiful example from a Hebrew illuminated manuscript showing a Jewish man taking an oath in Hebrew shua, as is written here in this manuscript above the Torah scroll, the oath taker holds. Oath-taking had a huge significance in the Middle Ages. We can still see some of its significance in our lives today if we think about, for example, the importance of the ritualized Hippocratic oath taken by doctors, the oath to swear in judges and presidents, and more. Just to take the case of Barack Obama. 
He had to repeat his oath of office when he was sworn in as president of the United States because they mixed up the words of the oath the first time. So apparently oaths are still relevant and important to, our, important to us now. Perhaps this is more true for medieval people. Medieval society was one filled with oaths. They were everywhere from court to everyday business dealings. People relied on oath as a tool to establish trust between any two parties. They were designed to address certain themes in, the, in their texts that both parties would accept and they employed a certain choreography with speech acts and gestures. We can get, we can get a pretty good idea of how oath taking looked from the various images that survived. survived. Here's one where you can see a man taking an oath. You can see the general gestures, or gesture of his fingers upright in the direction of the sun, aufgeregt mit den Fingern zu der Sonne, as oath takers declare in our sources repeatedly. You can also see here that his, uh, uh, that his other hand is placed on an object. This was another standard part of medieval oath taking, which used certain objects such as books, Bibles, relics, and sacred objects the oath was taken upon. And finally, oath taking required witnesses. The, the process of becoming a citizen was one opportunity for Jewish participation in the urban centers. It is well known that oath taking was a requirement for Christians to acquire citizenship in medieval German lands. What about the Jews in this case? The legal historian Guido Kisch, for example, showed already in the first half of the 20th century that the city of Worms accepted Jews as its citizens, at least until the mid 14th century. How did this work? Jews who wished to settle in Worms and become citizens negotiated first with the local Jewish community. Only after they came to an agreement, the Jewish community presented its new candidate to the Christian Municipal Council who accepted the candidates without restrictions. We see that the Jewish community enjoyed the trust of the urban governance and could decide which Jews wanted to, what they wanted to have in their town. We see that Jews took oath to gain citizenship in Worms and the oath must have been highly similar to those of the Christian candidates took. The process of Jews becoming citizens of Worms is described as follows. A Jew shall be accepted as citizen of Worms in the following manner. First, he shall go to the Bishop of the Jews, Judenbischof, and to the councilmen of the Jews, Judenratherren, so that they may accept him according to their customs. After the seventh, the Bishop of the Jews and their councilmen or other Jews shall bespeak the Bishop of Worms in favor of the Jews they have accepted among them. And they shall guide him to the Bishop of Worms and to the municipal councilman, and they shall report that they have accepted him, it is the new member of the Jewish community, as a citizen according to their customs. And this way, in this way, they, that means the bishop and the councilman, shall also accept him as citizen. And he shall swear that he will be loyal and law abiding towards the bishop, the municipal council, and the whole urban commune then finally he will be citizen. Item einen Juden soll man empfangen zu einem Bürger in die Reweise. Zu dem ersten soll er gehen zu der Judenbischof und zu der Judenratherren, dass sie ihn empfangen nach ihr Gewohnheit. Wann das geschehen ist, so soll der Judenbischof und ihr Ratherren Ader an der Juden bitt, dem Bischof den Juden, der do empfangen ist, von ihm und sollen ihn fuhren zu unserem Herrn, dem Bischof von Worms und den Ratherrn und sollen sprechen, dass sie ihn nach ihren Sitten empfangen haben zu einem Bürger. So sollen sie ihn auch zu einem Bürger empfangen und soll dann geloben, getrufen, getrufe und heut zu sehen, dem Bischof, dem Rade und der Stadt gemeinlichen. So ist er ein Bürger. This source is very rich when we think about Jewish participation in civic matters. First, look at all these people involved in the process of, uh, process of a Jew becoming a citizen. First, we have the Jewish community leader called here the Bishop of the Jews. Then we have the councilmen of the Jewish community as well as other Jews. They, as a group, talk to the Bishop of Worms and the Christian municipal councilmen. And in front of all these people and witnesses, the Jewish candidate swears an oath 
to be loyal to them as well as the whole, as well as to the whole city. We see that the Jewish community of Worms received the responsibility to take care of verifying that the candidate was suitable for the city of Worms. This, is, this also requires a certain trust by the city and the Jewish community. But this source also shows that new Jewish citizens of Worms took an oath of naturalization like Christians did. Another thing to consider then is that, the, that when Jews took an oath, they were doing so in the presence of members of the Christian urban commune who would function as addressees of the oath or its witnesses. Such public ceremonial acts would also allow Christians to participate in Jewish oath taking within the public spaces of any given town, in this case, Worms. Similar to the use of oath taking, another way Jews engaged in the process of, process of becoming a citizen in the urban centers of, German, of the German lands was using seals. Sealing too was very significant in medieval daily life. Because of this, hundreds of thousands of medieval seals survived. Seals were used to close contracts of all kinds and therefore had a primarily legal function. People sealed municipal documents, economic documents, etc. And by the 14th century, many urban groups participated in this sealing culture with their personal seal or through their respective institutions. But seals were also personal objects that often reflected who the seal bearer was, both in terms of where he or she belonged in the city, designating names and identities. I've always been fascinated by this sealing culture and dedicated my first book to how medieval Jewish men and women also used seals in the German lands. Most interesting to note before we dive into this field is that seals actually had no legal value in Jewish law. Instead, Jewish law stipulated that only Hebrew signatures were used. Still, the overwhelming importance of seals in Christian legal and social culture made a significant impact on how a number of Jews began to use personal or institutional seals in the late Middle Ages. When we analyze seals as a source, there are three things we have to pay attention to. First, the sealing the seal image in the middle, second, the seal inscription around the image, and finally, how the seal image and the seal inscription relate to each other. For Jews, like Christians, seals have a representative function since its combination of text and image allowed its owners to showcase themselves. The seal image, therefore, became a symbol one could recognize, and the seal stamp, which is used to press into wax, was carried on a lace or a chain around the neck or on a belt like jewelry. Seals made, a good, made good objects to showcase social and economic status and represent one's identity for Christians and for Jews alike. So let's look now at how Jews used seals as a form of civic participation in the Holy Roman Empire. Similar to, these, to the case we saw in Worms of using oath picking the process to gain Jewish citizenship in the mid 14th century Regensburg, we find Jews using seals in the process of gaining their citizenship. The Jewish community negotiated terms of citizenship first and only then the civic commune was addressed. This happened by ways of a letter of recommendation the Jewish community issued for the newcomer and which the civic commune received. The letter of recommendation had the seal of the Jewish community attached to it. We see here an example from 1356 in which the Jewish community issued a letter of recommendation to Aaron from Prague and his wife, Rachel. This record bears, this, bears the seals of the Jewish community as well as those of four representatives of the urban commune. Please note here that the first seal attached to the record is that of the Jewish community, and it is the biggest seal of all. The Jewish community communal seal on this record shows a moon crescent with a star. It bears a Hebrew seal inscription saying, seal of the Jewish community of Regensburg. Chotam Kahal Regensburg. The Jewish community issued and sealed this record while representatives of the government confirmed this letter of recommendation by attaching their seals as well. There is no indication for any objection from the municipality in regard to the Jewish citizens, to the new Jewish citizens. This can also be seen in a record from the year 1338. Here, 
Nachman from Munich, declared his will to become a citizen of Regensburg. However, before doing so, he had also de to declare that he would uh, come to terms with the Jewish community first, have them accept him as a member, and only then he would receive a letter of recommendation with which Nachman can come before the municipal council to become accepted as a citizen of Regensburg. Nachman confirmed his will to take the necessary step, steps and become a citizen with this record and attached his quite impressive seal to it, which we see here, unfortunately in very defective state. Nachman's seal shows a pentagram, two stars, two moon crescents, and perhaps a Jewish head with wings on the top here. Uh, uh, yeah, here we are. Probably there's the base, and there are the wings. Well, it's not clear because of this, because of its uh, defective state. Why one may understand this as a coat of arms, an adaptation of noble and patrician code of coats of arms. Its seal inscription is in Hebrew and reads Nachman, son of Sir Jacob, his memory for blessing. Nachman ben Raf Yaakov, Zikrono uh, Lefracha. The city received this written record with Nachman's seal as a promise to settle his dip dispute with the Jewish community and become a citizen of Regensburg. Let me remind you again at this point that seals were not discussed at all in Jewish law for closing contracts. Signatures were used instead. The seal inscriptions, the inscription therefore showcases what Nachman would have been written, what, what Nachman would have written as a signature. But by using his a personal seal, Nachman took part in medieval civic customs among Christians in German lands and used this chance to represent his social status and identity. There's little doubt that seals are an extraordinary example for the possibility individuals had to close contracts of legal matters like business contracts, and at the same time to use seals as tools for self-representation. As we can see here, Jews took part in this legal process and social game. Having now seen some examples for how medieval Jews used oath taking to gain citizenship in German lands, as well as how medieval Jews used seals to gain citizenship, let's look at some examples of how the two different methods were used together in other, in other civic matters of urban life. The record you see here is one example of this combination. It is a written record issued by the Jewish woman Dislebar in the process of release from prison in Regensburg. We see a few seals here. The first of them is the personal seal of Dislaba herself, who authenticated this document. Her seal inscription reads, reads Seal of Dislaba, daughter of Moses, Sigilum Dislaba Bat Moshe. Note here that the marker for the actual legal function of the seal, namely S for Sigilum, that is here. This is in, a, in the Latin letter S, while the remaining part of the seal inscription is in the Hebrew language. This mix of Latin and Hebrew, or German and Hebrew in some cases on Jewish seals was not, was not uncommon and gives us a further impression of how Jewish seal owners could fuse their identity into one to present, represent themselves. Considering how this document shows that Dislaba was imprisoned by the Municipal Council of Regensburg, we may find it surprising to see Dislaba sealing with such an impressive seal. But Dislaba used this seal precisely because she was imprisoned in Regensburg. The reason for sealing such records in the process of release from prison is because in the mid 14th century, the Municipal Council of Regensburg decreed that all citizens shall have a personal seal. If they did not yet have one, they were expected to order one from the local goldsmiths. From there on, even imprisoned citizens sealed their written records with their personal seals in case they came into prison. This gives, this, gives us, this gives us the impression that in some cases and in some places, Jews would actually have to engage in civic, civic sealing practices to engage with their local governments. In the later 14th century, Regensburg was troubled with wars and battles. Many citizens, among them Jews, voiced their dissatisfaction with the politics of the municipal council. The city was in great economic debt, and when in 1390, King Wenceslas 
decided to deprive the Jews from their uh, money lending records, the municipal council of Regensburg took its chances, agreed to the king's plans and joined him into his unjust action. The wealthier Jewish men and women of Regensburg were imprisoned and when released in 1391, they issued such release records like the one we see here by Dislava. The Jewish issuers of these haft or field records declared that they had been in, in prison for a long time and they also authenticated these records with their personal seals. What kind of civic participation is this where one was imprisoned unjustly on the one hand to take the Jewish money lending records by force and yet authenticated the re release record after imprisonment with one's personal seal as a sign of citizenship, participation, belonging and identity. One step further, in order to get released from prison, the authorities also requested an oath. Dislava, as well as other imprisoned Jews, had no choice but to take such oaths and swear that they will not take any steps of revenge to revenge their imprisonment, no matter if the imprisonment was just or not. True, oath-taking for release procedures from imprisonment was an obligation for Jews and Christians alike. The municipal authorities who decided over the release from prison saw the release procedure and its oath as necessary step for any possible reconciliation. With this, release records became a powerful tool to control civilians within the town to a certain degree. And as we have seen in this example of the Jewish woman Dislava, it is the combination of both her own oath and her own seal that were compulsory steps to engage with the town. Still, I'd like to underscore that oath taking was also a privilege since it created certain forms of trust between two parties. By taking an oath, the municipality accepted Dislava again as a member into its city. The city took certain steps to make this possible for her. Dislava was allowed, as other Jews were, to take her oath on a Pentateuch codex or even a Torah scroll instead of a New Testament or another foremost Christian object. Among the most important privileges Jews received was that to be able to take the oath according to their customs upon a Hebrew Bible codex or a Torah scroll whenever they had to swear off oaths in dealings with Christians. Ringsburg was part of Bavaria and the Bavarian Dukes confirmed this privilege of the Jews to take oath according to the Jewish customs in the year 1325 and followed with this the, the advice of their counselors. I quote, they, the Jews, shall only take an oath before our judges upon their own books, according to their old Jewish customs, which they still practice today in front of the synagogue. Dass sie keinen Eid vor unseren Richtern nicht tun sollen, dann den Eid, dann den Eid den sie auf ihren Buchen nach alter Gewohnheit herbracht haben, uns auf den heutigen Tag und auch vor ihr Schul. And from Nuremberg, we even have such a Hebrew Bible codex from the 15th century you see here, which was used for oaths Jews took in their various dealings with Christians, but especially in Lord court processes within the city of Nuremberg. Here's another example from the treasure trove of Jewish seals. This time we look at the seal of the Jewish community of Augsburg. I think we all agree that this is quite an impressive seal despite its defective condition. We see a double-headed eagle with a Jew's hat between its heads. This is a remarkable and creative Jewish take on an emblem because Christian emblems on other seals and coats of arms often showed a double-headed eagle or other animals, especially the lion with a crown with a royal crown. Instead, the Jewish owner placed a Jewish hat between the eagle's heads, as if the identity of this eagle had to be emphasized as being Jewish, and all this is surrounded by a highly representative bilingual seal inscription. The Hebrew side reads, seal of the Jewish community of Augsburg, Kotam Kahal Augsburg. And the Latin side reads, seal of the Jews in Augsburg, Sigillum Judeorum in Auguste. The seal, this bilingual with its bilingual uh, seal inscription, is, I think, an example, an ex excellent example 
for how the Jewish community showcased its concept of self and civic identity in a material object created to particip participate in their immediate urban environment. We have, as so often with the Jewish, as well as generally with seals, only this single impression left today, while the original seal stamp has not survived. The seal here was imprinted into, into the wax and attached to a charter from the year 1298. In this charter, the Jewish community represented by the 12 members, who most likely also constituted the Jewish council, Judenrat or Magistratus Judiorum, declared that they would build a part of the city's wall in return for the protection the city already granted them and would also grant them in the future. This part of the city wall the Jews were supposed to build was situated next to the Jewish cemetery. We can read the fact that the Jewish community enjoyed the trust of the urban commune in Augsburg to build part of the city's fortification as an indicator of their civic participation. The Jews were citizens in Augsburg and all new Jewish citizens were recorded alongside new Christian citizens into a municipal book, Bürgerbuch. But they were also integrated in the fortification concept and military services, since these belonged to the civic oblig obligations both the Jews and Christians had. Augsburg is not a unique case of Jewish citizens participating participating in, in the urban military services to protect the city. We can see this in other towns as well. And as early as 1074, the Jews of Worms were rewarded with the privilege of customs by King Henry IV because they had fought together with the citizens in favor of the king. In 1201, the Jews again are recorded as having fought in, an, in and protected the city of Worms. This even happened on a Shabbat when work of all kinds is forbidden and the famous rabbi Eliezer ben Yehuda of Worms explicitly allowed the participation in war on that Shabbat since their lives were in danger. From these examples, however, we can see the crucial importance of implementing as many trustful groups as possible into the protection of the city. Most recently, scholarship has analyzed many more examples of Jewish military services and their help in protecting the city, although much of these services were later um, abolished by paying certain amounts of money. Among those cases that we have been that have been examined, I wish to pick here only the fact that according to the local municipal law, the Jews in Strasbourg, around 1200, had to take care of the banner under which the whole city would march into war. This was an outstanding honorable task, and it is just another indicator of the Jews' civic participation and their acceptance within the urban um, commune. The source from Augsburg, again, we see here, can be read in the same way as the given examples. However, the Jewish community had several good reasons to start negotiations with the city to reach this agreement. While the negotiations took place, the so-called Rindfleisch massacres against the Jews were, were spreading in Franconia and Swabia. The German King Rudolf I was engaged in a war against Bohemia and the Bishop of Augsburg had lost much crown while the civic commune had gained power. Effective protection was therefore most likely to get from the city and not from the king or the bishop. This means that the Jewish community became active and started negotiating for the best terms they could reach in order to receive protection within the city, which bishop and king could not guarantee anymore while the urban commune could. To emphasize the importance of this contract from 1298, between the Jewish community of Augsburg and the urban commune, both parties sealed this record with their cooperative seals. The seal of the city of Augsburg was attached first, as you can see here, and that of the Jewish community second. Moreover, the Jews also took an oath towards the urban commune, promising to keep their part of the contract. We have vowed and asked and begged the urban commune with our own courage and free will to let us honor the city and act for the city's benefit and in service of the empire, we will build a wall in front of our cemetery. We do not know how the text of this oath was taken by, taken by the Jews of Augsburg looked, but we can see yet again how Jews engaged with their municipality and urban settings with the combination of formal oath and seals, aspects of life that are, all, that are not related 
by Jewish culture or, lit or religious law at all, but are almost entirely appropriated forms of, of, of municipal interaction in the urban centers of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, let me wrap up this lecture and come to some conclusions. How can we interpret the regionally different and over the centuries also chaining modes of civic, Jewish civic participation in the, in the medieval Holy Roman Empire? Where do we see the dynamic relationships between Jews and their urban governance? I suggest that the interest to include Jews the Jews, the Jewish communities to some extent into the urban settings followed a broader civic trend, which was, which has been described by Klaus Schreiner as the ideal of the Aristotelian burger or citizen with limitations that aimed in a common sense of concord and harmony and also to prevent conflicts within the city. Jews may have been one of many social groups, but they were also a separate religious group that was often integrated to some extent into the urban setting. This required, as I hope to have shown, considerable, considerable flexibility, both on the part of the local governments, allowing Jews to swear on the Torah scroll, for example, but also on the part of local Jews who actively participated in the urban culture of sealing with wax when they were accustomed to sealing or authenticating by signature. This engagement of Jewish, Jew, Jews in local customs and laws of the Christian majority is a result of their acceptance and utilization of such legal and social systems of the Christian majority cultures, but it, is also repeated, but it also repeatedly shows the will to engage with it. We have seen different examples and forms of civic participation upon, among the medieval Holy Roman Empire's Jewish population. These examples included naturalization and citizenship, sealing practices and the closing of legal contracts between Jews and Christians, even taking part in military service to protect the city. I have tried to connect these examples to the importance of sealing practices and oath taking. Both functioned as tools to mediate, mediate between Jews and Christians by relying on customs of both groups, common conceptions of law. Unfortunately, in so many cases, we have so few sources that can tell us more about the questions raised today in my talk. Often we see single examples, true pride hotspots, spots. But can we generalize from these pride spots to product themes? I think that it, what is clear, however, is that the facades of many of the perceptions and ideas about Jews and their relations to Christians get more and more cracks. Over the past two, to three decades, huge progress was made in understanding this history and more is to be expected. Civic participation is one of these fields that received much revision and many new nuances to think about and research further in the future. Jews can serve as an interesting case study for exploring civic participation since they can give us further food for thought with regard to the various other groups that inhabited medieval urban towns. Oath-taking and sealing practices, however, are in my eyes rich fields to study for the Christian-Jewish relations since both were meant to bridge certain gaps and mediate between both law and, uh, and, and customs between different groups of the same city. They brought Jews and Christians together on a daily basis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andreas, for this very rich and also very, very accessible uh, paper with your very plastic examples. I think uh, seeing the clapping hands on the screen uh, gives justice to your talk. And I'm sure that there, are, there's not only enthusiasm, but there are also questions uh, from the audience. So now the floor is open to uh, ask questions or give comments. Uh, who would like to start? We generally have a policy. I just want to mention to those who uh, are joining us for the first time in this lecture series that students have the privilege of asking questions uh, first if they have some and uh, other members of the audience can join afterwards so who would like to to begin uh, i don't see any immediate uh, hands raised at the moment so while you're thinking maybe i can still refute my previous statement and not as a student, but uh, I see Isidore now, very good. So 
Isidore and Josh. So then Isidore first and then Josh and others afterwards. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Andreas, for this uh, beautiful and uh, well illustrated talk. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, so my uh, question slash comment would be, I know of this uh, Stadtrecht from Ptui, which is like in the south of the Holy Roman Empire, today Slovenia. And it's from 1376. And several of the articles talk about uh, Jews, of course, in the, in the city. Uh, and one of the more famous, so yes, as you said, there is this sense of like their participation in the town. So the, there is this title of the Jewish judge, which is actually the Christian just, uh, judge for the Jewish affairs. So all the Jews that have like some issues with some Christians had to go to this uh, Jewish judge, which was basically a Christian, and then he uh, judged between them. Uh, but one of the one of the articles states that uh, Jews are not allowed to uh, either uh, trade in the city or to be uh, to hold uh, taverns or inns, which was a very interesting for me because, for example, the uh, the definitions of the like proper burghers or citizens uh, in Middle Ages was that uh, they had to be either traders or like craftsmen, craftspeople. So how would you relate this? Um, like, I, I know it could be very specific example, but uh, uh, how would you explain this uh, dichotomy or of sorts? Thank you. Thank you, Isidore, for this uh, question. I'm of course not a specialist for Ptui. Uh, luckily, we have uh, two specialists here who might want to add something uh, in a minute. Um, but regarding the different jobs we really see, um, and that's um, a topic I'm very much interested in at the moment since I'm writing my book, my new book about Jewish craftspeople is that they really were engaged in all kinds of uh, crafts and trades. And we even can see um, that there are indeed sources that might indicate that in some very few cases, Jews were also part of guilds. We have a fine source from the first half of the 14th century, uh, although that is still not a proof for Jews being in guilds, but we, but the ordinance from that town of Reutlingen, Esslingen in uh, the 13th, uh, 1330s um, gives a hint to, to this, uh, to this um, possibility. And it's especially in uh, the field of parchment making and tannering which uh, seems to indicate that book production was especially important and that makes a lot of sense, I think. So this would be uh, one thing. As for the special um, Stadtbuch um, entry that would ordinance, that would um, uh, deny you Jews in trading, I, 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 I'm, not, um, I'm not knowledgeable about this one. Maybe Birgit and Eveline wanna say something about this because I think they have, studied this uh, very well, but I simply do not know it. <laughs> Sh shall I just uh, uh, change a few words uh, to add a few words? Um, uh, actually, Ptui is in that time is, is a town of the Archbishop of Salzburg. So, and uh, what these, what the, it's not really, it's not really a, a Stadtrecht. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a Weistum. I have no idea whether there is an English <laughs> word for Weistum. Uh, so it's not it's not a, a law that was given to the town, but it, it's a, it's a, a, it's a noting down of yeah the customs of the city. You could say uh, whether this this trading and, and we're not. I'm not quite sure what the trading refers to actually. Whether it, it whether it refers to long distance trade, or whether it refers to trade within the city or short distance trade. It's not the wording is is not quite not quite clear. Um, as to the taverns, that that's I wouldn't say typical. But that's uh, that's does does appear from time to time. It it, it reflects back to this old, uh, well, kind of anti-Jewish idea that 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 Jews and Christians uh, should not drink together, should not eat together. Whether this is the reality, <laughs> that's that's a totally 
totally different uh yeah thing evelyn add something yeah. <laughs> yes and if I, if I might add since this is a Weizstum, so an attempt by the city to codify its own customs or what they claim to be their customs, they try to codify things that keep keep kind of the, the, the competition away. So this is what you find in many of these kind of documents, like this, this is a comp not so much because they are Jews, but because they are competition. And this is a way kind of to keep them away from the traits that we want to do ourselves. Yeah, and we actually we do have, I think it's, it's, it's about... 20 years later, no, uh, 50 years later, we do have uh, hints of, of Jewish trade in, 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 an, in an argument between the Archbishop of Salzburg and the, and the Syrian Duke, which is kind of unclear what, you really re what they really refer to, but there is, there is sort of evidence of, of actual Jewish trade in, in this area. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 thank, thank you. I Sorry, Andreas, please. Yeah. No, no, easy to go for it. No, I just want to thank you all. Yes, because it's funny because in the same article when it says that like they're not allowed to trade or to have like taverns, it also says that they need to participate if there is any damage uh, or any like catastrophe happening. Yeah. So it is this, as you said, like uh, on the one hand, keeping the competition uh, back or off, but then on the other hand, like making them like sort of participate in the... Uh, common budget yeah. Uh, budget yeah yeah because so, this is also because they usually do not pay taxes with the city it's also you usually they pay them directly to the to the uh, uh, to the the, the archbishop the in that in that yeah. case yes and so the cities want to make sure that at least in an extraordinary circumstance the jews have to pay to get the taxes together with with the city which they usually do, do not do but we, we don't want to monopolize <laughs> <laughs> Slovenia, although Slovenia is beautiful. So, um, just to complement what was being said about the taverns, um, there's a project I'm working on now about uh, Jewish dancing and singing, and in a lot of Hebrew sources like the Sefer Chasidim and different uh, responsa, you find a lot of, of Hebrew sources talking about the issue of uh, Jews and Christians meeting in taverns. Um, so uh, going back to what you said, it, it's, it's interesting that it comes up a lot in the, in the Christian sources, but also one thing that's coming out more and more is how much uh, that was on people's minds, the meeting in taverns between Jews and Christians, and how also Jewish religious leaders were trying to inhibit that. So just uh, to give a little bit of the other side. I also um, recently came across a source from a 15th century Worms where the Jews were called by the bishop and his, um, um, his, his, his um, I don't know, his, his um, followers to join him in the um, tavern of the higher patricians of the city in order to negotiate certain terms and then take oath together for towards the bishop, of course. And we have, of course, uh, many false sources uh, showing clearly that uh, Jews and Christians were eating and drinking together. And I think that, for example, the uh, uh, beautiful article Markus Wenninger wrote about uh, Jews and Christians on Jewish weddings together, um, celebrating together, and especially this uh, important case from Zurich from the 14th century, where basically the whole uh, League of Patricians participate, participated in the Jewish wedding um, are, are very uh, significant examples for this. Well, thank you very much. It's extremely enjoyable to see how various uh, aspects come in together and it turns into a proper conversation, not a, a formal question and answer session. So uh, but now, Josh, you have been waiting for a while to, to ask your question. Hi, yes, uh, Andreas. Thank you again for the discussion and thank you for the topic. Um, this is something that's slightly outside of the field that we were talking about. Um, and you actually already answered part of it. I was curious as well about the taverns, but in a more general sense, uh, heading slightly to the east towards what used to be uh, Kievan Rus or even the Principality of Moscow, uh, is there evidence of Jewish communities being granted citizenship in those areas? Is there any idea that that was prevalent or common in those areas? Or is there just 
too little historiography and too little data from those regions? Um, the true answer is that I really don't know. Um, I'm also not able to read these sources. Um, maybe here again, my colleagues can jump in, but I, I, I don't know anything about it. We know, of course, we have, of course, very early sources already, I think since the 11th century, if not even since the 10th century, that report in Hebrew sources, report from Jews traveling as merchant toward uh, Wuz uh, and also other regions and coming back. And we have this uh, beautiful story of uh, telling, uh, I think it's from the 11th century, telling us in a Hebrew source, telling us that Jews would build uh, a, a, a fortification with their carts uh, on Shabbat to rest for 24 hours on their way to Rus. But that is really all I know. Uh, I know that this example is, for, is um, given in uh, Michael Toch's book, English book about the economic history of the Jews. There you can find it. But that is the only example I can think of right now. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, further questions, comments, additions? Uh, Emilia, please. Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Um, really wonderful paper, really interesting. Um, uh, could you say a bit more about um, iconography of uh, these, these Jewish seals? Um, what do we know about them in a the sense? Did they, did they copy? I mean, yeah, I mean, what kind of imagery they employed? To what extent they were copying Christian um, forms, but adopting them in a way it wouldn't be offensive, so to say, um, to the users. Uh, thank you, Emilia, for this question. This is, um, of course, one of my most uh, favorite uh, topics and therefore the most important in the world. Um, Jews um, and Christians really had, that we can see from the Corpus of Seal, Seals for German Lands, had a common Jewish Christian or Christian Jewish uh, corpus of uh, images, of seal images. Uh, you really find actually in the Middle Ages until really until the mid 16th century, not really any images you wouldn't find um, on a Christian, you would not even, would not also find on Christian seals as well. The question is how they um, interpreted these uh, images. And um, as we know from the seals of Christians, also from uh, municipal seals. Um, they basically used every possibility to 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 uh, have a um, to have a how do you call it? Um, I lost the word. A um, a talking seal, um, a chanting seal. That's it. A chanting image. So um, if, if this possible possibility was given, they would use it. And we see this in many cases indeed that these images would refer to the names or the family names or the places. Um, and in some cases also uh, would refer to the beliefs. And um, there are no images we, we do not also see on the seals of Christians. Even the head the Jews show on their seals like the one from Augsburg, for example, or the one we might read into uh, Nachman's seal, the Jew's head or the head of the, the Jews. Um, even this one we find in Christian seals and that's in those Christian seals who have the feminine name or by name, Judeos, Jude and so on. Um, we find them in several cities and regions. For example, very famous, the one the patrician family since the 11th or 12th century Cologne, which would use, uh, which is called uh, the Juden, uh, in, and they call themselves in Latin Judeos, and they would use a Jew's head or in, in, a, in a shield of arms, in a coat of arms, or a, a Jew's head with a long beard, so to say, a, the, the patriarchs, uh, an image, an idealized image of the wise patriarch uh, with a Jew's head that clearly makes shows this is um, this, this points to the name Jewish, right, Jews. And that is very interesting. So even there, we don't find any images, um, uh, even the Jews head is not an exception. And uh, in the Rhineland, I've seen gravestones with coat of arms uh, having a Jews head as well. That does this uh, answer your question? 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. So well, many thanks also for um, this kind of lively interaction. Susanne, uh, you are the next and then Zoe will follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you Andreas also from my, my side. side. Um, uh, you, you, sh you, you showed us um, uh, how these uh, or that these seals are a kind of sign or a symbol for the fact that um, Jewish and Christian people <laughs> were living together. I am um, uh, interested um, in uh, rather in this fact that we are dealing here with two different uh, law and custom systems, um, which is also um, <laughs> shown by the, some of these charters where you have a, a Roman German seal and a Jewish uh, seal. Um, but then um, what about legal conflicts? Then, do you have examples of of this? What what happened if one side did not keep the agreement that was written down and sealed? Do you know what I mean? In yes, yes. Thank you very much. So, um, <laughs> of course, we see very different and uh, often overlapping uh, judicial systems in the towns uh, from the bishops, from uh, other local rulers from the city, mm -hmm. uh, um, even in later um, centuries, uh, or since the, let's say, 15th century, especially from guilds and so on and so on. And, um, and we have um, uh, the uh, autonomy of the Jewish community with regards mm -hmm. to their judicial system. So um, first of all, Jews with Jews would go to the uh, Jewish court of law, the Beit mm -hmm. Din, and would be judged and uh, settle conflicts according to the Jewish law. But mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that they would not run after, so the one who would lose in court could still run to the to another Christian court, of course. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, what, I mean, what basically everyone could do, right? Um, mm -hmm. to, to, to call uh, for another law court, technically mm -hmm. at least. And we see this happening time and again. Um, and yet there were um, several, um, several institutions that tried to get uh, to, to, to bridge these gaps. For example, as we mm -hmm. have seen for Petui, the, the, the office of the Judex Judiorum, the Judenrichter, who would in many towns, uh, for example, mm -hmm. in Regensburg, since we had this example, would judge together um, uh, in, in uh, how do you say mm -hmm. this in English, paritätisch, um, in, 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 um, in, in the same parts, right? At, at, mm -hmm. at the same amount of judges, uh, Christians mm -hmm. and Jews sitting together uh -huh. and judging over uh -huh. over disputes. Uh -huh. That is another possibility. And uh -huh. uh, if, if the Jewish system would fail, um, uh -huh. for example, the, the uh, municipal council and its law, law court system uh -huh. could intervene. And we see this in the late 14th century, for example, uh -huh. in Zurich, where the uh -huh. uh, Jewish system uh -huh. simply failed because of disputes between uh, uh -huh. Jews in the community where they built uh, two parties. Mm -hmm. So if the contract was broken, of course, um, um, it depends uh, who were the parties. So if the mm -hmm. Jewish community would break the, the um, contract by not mm -hmm. building the wall in Oxford, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. had pledged here, and I did not mention this mm -hmm. because we were running mm -hmm. out of time, but the Jewish community pledged their uh, cemetery, their Jewish cemetery, uh, mm -hmm. in order to build this wall. And mm -hmm. this is uh, no no single instance. So if they would mm -hmm. have broken the contract, um, they would mm -hmm. have uh, probably uh, got into trouble with their Jewish cemeteries, cemetery, mm -hmm. which was probably the most important mm -hmm. institution of the Jewish community, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. more important than the than the synagogue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Andreas, for this. Uh, informed uh, response and now uh, Zoe should come. Um, hi, yes. So I was wondering what you think about um, Jews and civic participation before uh, the emergence of, or, or at least the rise of seals in the Judenide. Um, 
is it a matter of not having uh, of of sources not um, of of these sort of interactions being recorded, or is it um, because of the transformation of the administration into being more of a written one, um, or is were the communities too small to have such uh, an impact? Uh, I just was wondering what you thought. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Zoe, for uh, this question. That's a that's a that's a tricky and excellent question. So um, the reason why I brought this example from um, Speyer from 1084 uh, was because I tried to show other ways of civic participation before we had um, this whole fully fledged um, system of oath and and seals in towns. And um, so, first of all, regarding the seals. Um, they came up with the Jews at the same time, pretty much when uh, also other civil, civilian citizens in the towns, Christians, of course, started sealing. So this is parallel to the Christians, more or less. And um, before this uh, rise of the sealing culture at, uh, towards the 13th and then especially in the 14th century, we simply didn't have it. So um, I cannot say anything about this. You used institutions to seal and you had much uh, less written records, of course. The um, exponential growth in record making is something we see since the end, since the end of the 13th and, and then especially in the 14th century. Regarding, regarding oath, uh, on the other hand, we have oath since the Carolingian period, basically. Um, and you have oath, uh, whenever you had Jewish communities, you also had oath taking. And you had the right granted to Jews to take oath on their books. And it was repeated and confirmed time, confirmed time and again. Um, no matter which uh, status of if they were civilians as citizens or not. So the oath was there before already. And one of the, uh, the earliest example for the uh, German empire is indeed, we have Maria here from Erfurt. Uh, the oath that was written down latest around 1200. And it's uh, also one of the earliest um, uh, documents in German language. Uh, so it's very important. And there we have an oath text um, that was sealed uh, and brought forward by um, the um, civic community of uh, Erfurt with their communal seal in a very nice uh, uh, writing on parchment. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, by the way, all of you who are interested in more about this, uh, you can read Andreas's excellent articles on our Moodle site. So I highly recommend uh, you to look at that. Uh, further questions, comments? Yeah, if I would uh, just one point. Because... Maybe I can come in. At, uh, Isidore? Would you sorry, like sorry to... Catalina, you, you have a question. I'll, I just sure, want but... to. Uh, okay, I, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, so uh, uh, two points that has been made like uh, in previous comments and uh, questions. Uh, and again, I'll go back to Ptui because uh, I'm not a specialist in Jewish history. I'm a specialist in Ptui history because it's my uh, hometown and I'm contractually obliged to mention it uh, every time I, <laughs> I talk. Uh, anyway, so uh, yes, in this, in this uh, Stadrecht, it also states that, it's, um, that the Jewish people should be judged by Jewish laws when they're, of course, uh, between them. Uh, this is one point. And then the other point, if you would elaborate, please, Andreas, you said that cemeteries were even more important than synagogues. Uh, now, we know for Ptui that uh, cemeteries were outside the city limits, city uh, walls. Uh, we have some uh, like uh, monuments, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, basically from the... From the tombstones. Uh, tomb tombstone, yeah, thank you. Uh, some tombstones are already like from the early 12th century, possibly even 11th, uh, 11th century, but it's uh, but we don't have like other written sources uh, until like the late 13th or 14th century. So we have evidence that there was a Jewish community already around uh, 1100. Uh, so if you could just elaborate a little bit on this, how, because again, I'm not a specialist, uh, so how was uh, Jewish community and their relationship to the cemetery. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, so in recent years, the theory um, was brought forward and I think also pretty well confirmed by sources and by uh, broad investigations that 
those communities who would have their own cemetery would be so-called, uh, let's say, mother communities. And around them, other communities would circle and would bring their death to their uh, dead people uh, to this cemetery. So by seeing this, we clearly see that um, those mother communities had central function. And this central function was not because of its uh, synagogue, because you could have synagogues and also smaller communities. You could have synagogues in a single room of a house, of a private house, and they had it. <laughs> you also had several synagogues in uh, several towns, right? Um, but uh, the cemetery was uh, truly extraordinary and not every community had it, but um, was um, regionally spread in a way that um, also the smaller communities without Jewish cemeteries could reach them, I think, within one day, which would make sense since you had to bury within one day. And um, so um, these were also districts for taxation. So the mother community usually would take care of taxation by taking also the taxes from the smaller surrounding uh, Trabant communities. And that is what uh, makes the Jewish cemetery so much more central than a synagogue. Although there's no doubt that the central Jewish life took place in the synagogue, of course, and in its courtyard. Does that uh, answer your question? Perfectly, thank you very much. Thank you, I think this is a very important aspect and it's very good that it came up uh, during the discussion. Um, and may I then uh, come in with uh, a question? One of the questions I would have had, you have more or less answered when you answered to Zoe's uh, inquiry, because I was just uh, thinking about the chronological uh, dynamics of uh, say the the general worsening of uh, Jews' situation in uh, the Holy Roman Empire from the uh, been talking about, but probably it can be explained just by the increase in the general. Uh, level of literacy and the number of documents or can on the one side and the number of seals and uh, documents connected to, to Jewish self-representation uh, increased. Okay. And uh, yeah, I would have another smaller question, but that connects your new topic to, to your earlier research on seals. So do you think that these Jewish seals were made by Jewish craftsmen? Mm. Okay, let's, let's start with the second question because that one I understood much better before the connection was a little bit bad. Maybe you have to repeat part of it. Um, uh, in, in most cases, we really don't know who made the seals, but um, at least for um, the city of Regensburg, I think I could show by comparing um, seals um, of a uh, of the uh, urban corpus we have from Regensburg, because Regensburg is the only city we have so far, a full corpus of its uh, surviving um, seals of, of the citizens. Um, interestingly, this, uh, the Jews are not mentioned in this work, but everyone else. <laughs> and uh, so that was good for me in the end, because I could use it to compare. And there I could see from the styles and um, um, other specialists for seals, um, were so kind in helping me, um, confirming this uh, theory that indeed some of those seals from Regensburg come from a workshop of a Christian goldsmith. We know that it was made by this Christian goldsmith because he his seal has survived in a few impressions and the style is uh, absolutely the same. Um, if it was not him, and his uh, um, matrixes that were used then, it was at least someone from his workshop. So here we know it's been, um, at least in several cases, it's been Jew uh, Christian uh, goldsmiths, but we have uh, Jewish goldsmiths in our sources and we know also of Jewish seal makers. So obviously um, Jews could make seals and Jews could also have seals made by um, Jewish uh, artisans. Um, the question you have seen 
um, how nice the inscriptions were, especially the Hebrew. The question really is in a seal that is uh, in its diameter, three, two and a half, two centimeters, if a Christian was able to engrave such an image uh, in the negative, right, in, in such a, uh, a metal seal stamp, it's, a, it's an interesting question and uh, it should be something that uh, one could simply um, test by using a goldsmith, uh, engraving uh, a, a, a Hebrew inscription in such a seal and see how, if, he, if he can do it without knowing the Hebrew letters. And I know maybe he, uh, Maria wants to report about this. Um, this was done in, um, in Bavaria uh, in a workshop for gravestones. And the, um, the result was quite surprising. Maria, do you want to say something about this for a moment? Yeah. I, I can I can try to uh, yes we we try to um, test first if only um, a mason would be able to um, make these uh, stone inscriptions and that was quite impressive you I think every one of us who has not not two left hands uh, could learn that in two or three days, but it's a different way with goldsmith work. That's totally different. Um, I think with stone and with letters like this size, that can be possible. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, we had a um, Christian, we, ha we had a not Jewish stonemason. I don't know if he's Christian or something, um, modern stonemason. And he was given um, just the Hebrew text and we asked him just to copy it on stone. And it was a total failure. It was so funny what he was doing. Um, so for stonemasons, I would say, yeah. Uh, in, also in the Middle Ages, we can expect that m some of our tombstones we have till today were made by, by Jewish stonemasons, but for the goldsmiths, we can test it next time in our workshop, but I think, I think, I think we should. Yeah. Okay, but I think and, and that's I, much more much more difficult because of the of the, the, the tiny instruments and um, but but we know about Jewish goldsmiths and then I I don't I, I and I have no doubt that they would be able also to to um, to make a nice Hebrew seal. Right. Yeah. And, and Maria and I, we are planning to write an article about Jewish goldsmiths and, of course, probably seal makers. But planning. I wish to add, I, <laughs> planning. <okay. laughs> so, and, and I want to, to add here also that those Jewish seals I could show were made by Christian goldsmiths had a Latin inscription only, not a, not a Hebrew inscription. So that is also interesting. Um, as for the first question, Katalin, um, I, didn't, I didn't really understand everything you said because of your connection. Um, you were asking about the reasons for the worsening of the situation no. for the Jews, no? No, no, not exactly. I was just uh, asking about uh, the chronological difference of worsening the situation on the one side and uh, the increased number of seals and mm. uh, self modes of Jewish self-expression, self-representation right. right. on the other. I, I, th I think uh, with regards to the seals, these those seals that have survived have mostly survived really by more or less by chance. There's so much that has been lost and we don't know how much there really was. So by looking into those corpora of seals and regions and cities that were that 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 uh, have survived most, um, I wouldn't dare to say, okay, this was a center of sealing practices of Jewish sealing practices and so on. Um, but uh, if we look, for example, to Regensburg, where um, especially many seals have survived, Jewish seals, um, they almost all are on these Haftofil records, meaning on records that have survived or have been uh, um, uh, issued, thrown up, because Jews were imprisoned for different reasons. And um, that was uh, something um, we see since the 14th century throughout the German Empire, but Regensburg was very uh, let's say en vogue in, in, in this um, producing of records and was also seems to be uh, very restrictive in producing such, um, such, such uh, records and putting uh, its uh, citizens and other people into prison. 
Um, so um, the, the reason why we have um, in, in later times in the little, late Middle Ages much more um, records with seals is also because of its general uh, exponential growth, growth of uh, record making and therefore simply more has survived um, than, than let's say from the uh, second half of the 13th century. I think that is the uh, main reason I would say. Well, many thanks, that's absolutely reasonable. Yeah, yeah, Hannah. Hi everyone, Andrea, thank you. Um, I'm excited about this idea of, um, of the non-Jewish craftsmen making the seals and it, it got me thinking and I'm excited for the, for the article uh, uh, by you and Maria, I wanna read that obviously. But one thing I'm thinking was um, the work of Professor Judith Azoe Schlanger. She's a, a medieval Hebrew paleographer. Um, and I was thinking about one of her conclusions that uh, I heard her speak about recently, which was even just when you're reading uh, uh, Hebrew manuscripts, you can read and see the accents of different people from their script. And one thing, even just, just from the writing, from the strokes of their script. And then she, she also uh, talked about how uh, Jewish converts or, or Christians who converted to Judaism, you can also see um, in their script that they weren't natively Jewish. Like, they, like you can tell that Hebrew wasn't their first language. So sort of like a, uh, uh, yeah, an accent. Um, so I wonder also if that would translate, I mean, it must, right? If, if it's perce perceivable through, from the strokes of a brush, I would imagine that, you know, the, the negative Hebrew engravings of a seal would also equally be discernible as, you know, a non-Jewish or a non-native speaker or an accented Hebrew speaker. So that may be kind of, that's one thing that I was thinking about, maybe an interesting um, question for you, Andreas. I mean, you've looked through, I don't know how many uh, seals, hundreds or more uh, seals. Do you get a sense for, in the text mm -hmm. for accents, for non-native Hebrew strokes? Um, what's your sense there? Um, so since these um, seals have not preserved, has, have not survived as um, sealed stamps, we actually have only one single personal sealed stamp that has survived from the Middle Ages. And that sealed stamp was destroyed and found by chance during excavations in Trier on the very place where the former medieval Jewish cemetery was. And it was obviously given into the grave of one of those Jews that have been buried there. And we even know this Jew from the sources, he worked um, in the office of the archbishop in the financial court. So this, his personal seal was some kind of a official seal. And therefore it makes much more sense that it would have been destroyed after his death and put into the grave. Um, so this, this is the first thing. Um, most of these seals have survived only in the wax and impressions. And it's much more difficult to read those um, from, from these copies uh, in wax uh, after 500 years and in, uh, in a highly defective state. Uh, I would not dare as a non-paleographer for Hebrew script to, to make a, a, certain, um, a, a certain comment uh, on, on, on the script. Uh, I hope that someone will start and do a paleographic anal analysis at some point. But what I can say is that indeed, I found at least one example where uh, we see a Hebrew inscription, not a bilingual, but only Hebrew inscription. And there, um, since Hebrew is written from right to left, but Latin script from left to right, we can see that the seal actually um, starts at the point where the Hebrew inscription would start and vice versa. And we can see that the um, non uh, that the Christian seal goldsmith would ha have has read this inscription, but started at the end with the engraving. So the last letter, he started engraving the last letter because he engraved from uh, left to right, right? 
and not from right to left. And therefore the seal inscription is, is not, uh, it's not uh, symmetric. And this is one indicator for why this was um, a, a, a proper uh, copy he used, but he started with the last letter and not with the first letter according to the Hebrew script. But he read it for, in the Latin way, right? From left to right. So there we have one indication. Uh, but that's really it I can I can um, offer. Sorry. No, thank you very much. I think it's very nice to get into the workshop, really, with <laughs> all these uh, delicate details. I also see probably those of you who follow the chat can see that uh, Emilia remarked that there are examples of Hebrew manuscripts illuminated in Christian workshops. And yeah, of course, she yes. refers to, to Eva Freimovic uh, on that. So but that would, I think, merit a different lecture and in, in a, a different context. Right. Uh, There's also a beautiful book by Sarit Shalev Eni uh, mm. on uh, the Constance manuscripts from the Lake Constance area, where she really shows how um, uh, Jews came to Christian workshops for illuminating their uh, Bibles, their, their manuscripts. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. Further <laughs> questions, comments? Uh, remarks. If that's not the case, I think we have uh, served our, our time and it's especially late for those of you who are joining in for, from Jerusalem. So uh, thank you very much, Andreas, for this wonderful illuminating lecture. And thank you. also for all of uh, those of you who uh, added your thoughts and uh, remarks in the discussion. Uh, I'm really grateful for this kind of community, intellectual community this evening. And I would like to, to call your attention to the rest of the, the lecture series. Some of you have uh, followed it from the beginning. Some of you have joined for the first time, but I think it would be really rewarding for you to join uh, next week as well, when our uh, distinguished colleague Vanessa Harding will give a lecture on guilds, fraternities and civic life in London, 1300, 1700. So we remain with the craftspeople, but in a different context. So I hope to see many of you. And thank you very much once more, Andreas, for your wonderful contribution to the series. Thank you.